Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about YouTubers who ruin their careers in seconds. There are a lot, and I'd like to make this a series probably gonna see a part two coming in the future but there are a lot of og youtubers that i forgot existed and i just remember wow they did something horrible but i know i'm like mr long intro i'm sorry about that i'll make this one short if there is anything i want to say it's that new music video coming out october 3rd yes you guys finally don't have to listen to cherry soda on repeat anymore i got you guys with a new music video spotify apple music all of that yeah october 3rd be there for the live premiere it'll be on this channel it's gonna be so fun with the live chat and everything i'm thinking november the ep will be out and that ep will have music videos to every single song and that'll be like a 30 minute video here on the main channel so that's just to hype you guys up but let's get started with our list Vitaly ZD TV. Vitaly Zdorovetsky, also known as Vitaly ZD TV, was once the go to YouTube channel for hilarious pranks, with funny and original concepts at the time, such as Gold Digger pranks, Russian Hitman pranks, In the Hood pranks, and who could forget classics such as How to Get Girls to Kiss You, Getting Girls Panties, and The Amazing. Can I Eat Your Booty? The channel now sits at 10 million subscribers and over 1 billion video views, though his recent uploads don't match that of a 10 million follower channel. So what happened? If we want to understand the fall of a man who was once getting a minimum of 20 million views per video, we have to go to the very beginning, before he was even a prankster on YouTube. Let's go back to when Vitaly was 18 in 2010. A Russian friend of his called him up and told him he could make easy money if he just appeared in an adult video. Being broke and living with his mom and abusive stepfather, he took the chance. And that's when this infamous video was filmed. The video was a bang bus film where the girl picks up guys and fucks them in the van, though Vitaly couldn't get hard, so it was an extremely awkward 12 minute video. Yes, I watched all of it. Yes, I was alone. Yes, I had lotion. The next year in 2011, Vitaly would create his YouTube channel and begin uploading pranks to no avail. It wasn't until June 2nd, 2012 that he'd upload the Miami zombie attack prank, a video where Vitaly pretends to be on bath salts scaring the locals. This of course was a reference to the situation that occurred only a week prior where a man on bath salts bit off a homeless person's face. Kind of a weird thing to base your prank off of, but hey, it was 2012 and I understand it was a different time. The video gained 10 million views in a week and gained Vitaly 70,000 subscribers. This even caught the attention from Daniel Tosh from Tosh.0. I wonder what Daniel Tosh is doing now. Oh, and not to mention CNN. So, a guy in, in Miami, a prankster, decides to go out uh, dress up as a zombie and, uh, and, and covered in blood and he starts running around chasing people. Look what he does to this guy. Like, you can see the front of his shirt when he turns. He's, he's covered in blood and he, he chases this poor guy here and numerous people and they're rolling on it, right? It's a prank. So he chases people around scaring the absolute heck out of them. <laughs> he rolled the momentum and kept making prank videos and started becoming the face of YouTube pranks along with FouseyTube, Roman Atwood, Dennis Rohde and several others. Saying Vitaly got into a lot of controversies is an understatement. But I'll tell you guys the biggest ones. In 2014, Vitaly was arrested for streaking the field during the 2014 World Cup final in Brazil. He had natural born prankster across his chest. On May 25th, 2016, he was arrested for trespassing after climbing the Hollywood sign. Back to our breaking news, a man believed to be a YouTube prankster has climbed the Hollywood sign. Tim Lynn monitoring the situation overhead in Sky 5. Tim. He had a flag, like you said earlier on, it says, I'm back. I don't know where he was before, but apparently he is back. The next month, on June 10th, he was again arrested for shrieking during Game 4 of the NBA Finals between the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Golden State Warriors. This time with Trump sucks on his chest and LeBron for president on him. 2017, he shrieked at the World Series. He also got banned from attending any sort of sporting event, so he eventually got his girlfriend and his mom to streak for him. I, I guess they really love him. In January of 2020, Vitaly was arrested and spent five days in an Egyptian jail after climbing the pyramids of Giza. Oh yeah, let's raise money. I did this for a good cause. Spread awareness by these beautiful pyramids in Egypt. Egypt, I love you. Oh yeah, and in 2016, he also starred in his own movie with Roman Atwood and Dennis Rohde, which uh, wasn't that great. It was clear to see Vitaly was becoming addicted to the views. As time went on, YouTube became stricter and began punishing creators for making edgy content. This was horrible for Vitaly, as it meant he either was out of a job or had to become family friendly. He ended up becoming family friendly and now does toy reviews. Imagine, no, fuck no, no. He instead made an uncensored subscription service to see his videos 
uncensored. But by the looks of it, that didn't go anywhere. Vitaly began losing relevancy as YouTube suppressed his content. And in 2020, his name was back in the news, but for something no one expected. In April of 2020, he was arrested and later charged for aggravated battery by the Miami Beach police. Vitaly tackled a female jogger and struck her multiple times on the head and chest. Your boy can stay back there. Put your hand on the car, man. No, just put your hand on the car. Just lean on the car, please. Lean on the car right there. I'm sorry, guys. And he seemingly did this for no reason, but it was later revealed that he was on shrooms. No, but mushrooms are good. I never had a bad trip until that one time where I flew. So I was COVID, um, COVID mushrooms. I was bored. Last thing I remember is a chum please help, please help. And I tried to hug her and she pushed me or whatever. And and uh, yeah, the fucking, uh, I hit her and I realized what I was doing on top of her. And I was like, what the fuck? And I didn't even run back to the house. The article says I tried to hit in my house. I didn't know what was happening. He was released from custody after a $7,500 bond. Vitaly reunited with his attorney, Roger P. Foley, and released a video on how Roger was able to get him to avoid 15 years in prison. After filing in on the case, the charges were immediately reduced to a felony battery, a third degree felony. And after a few months, the case was reduced to a misdemeanor and eventually dismissed. I feel like if the charges got dropped because you have a really good lawyer, I don't know why you would make a video on it. It kind of seems like a big fuck you to the woman that got attacked like, hey i avoided 15 years in jail because i got a good lawyer it's kind of a weird video to make fast forward to 2022 and vitaly seems to be trying to make a comeback to youtube with classics such as can i eat you out how tight are you and epic farting on girls prank someone needs to tell vitaly we're not in 2015 anymore he even does the what's up guys intro unironically and it's it's pretty sad. What's up, villains? Welcome to another video. The prank format on YouTube isn't what it used to be. Great examples of new prank channels are Balin Levine, Loaf, Kaisen Nat, Jideon, and the list goes on. But these new era of prank channels have one thing in common. They all have a lovable main character. With Vitaly, it's going to be hard for him to gain an audience again, especially after being a woman beater. But I guess we'll see what's next for Vitaly. Yo, hold on, guys. Someone's knocking at my door. Hey buddy, you're under arrest. What do you mean I'm under arrest? Because you don't have the new Earl drop. What the fuck are you talking about? You know, Earl, the brand you own, the new collection that just dropped the back to school collection. And if people use code back to school, they get 20% off anything at the store. Hey, 20% off sounds really good. Give me that. There you go. Wow, this is really good quality. I'm gonna put it on off camera. Yes, off camera. Yeah, I don't get to see my nipples yet. <laughs> oh my god, it's embroidered. Look at that. Y'all still go to college? Nah, we go to Earl University. Isn't that right, cop, that randomly came to my room? Hey, that's very true. My kids actually go to Earl University. <laughs> anyway, uh, you're extremely cute. Hey, what can I say? You are too. <laughs> Get the fuck out of my room. <laughs> okay, okay. Guys, make sure to use code back to school to get this amazing Earl hoodie, which I will be wearing for the remainder of the video. Earl doesn't exist.com. Let's move on to the next one. Rice gum. The story of Brian Lee is a really upsetting one, as I was a big fan of his in 2016. Back in 2016, it was definitely a, a different era. We had YouTubers such as Leafy, Pyrocynical, Grade A Under A, Drama Alert, H3H3, iDubs, Filthy Frank, and yes, some of those YouTubers still upload to this day, such as Pyrocynical. Shout out Pyrocynical. If you know me, that's crazy because I look up to you. But we're talking about Ricegum in specific. I made a video dissecting Ricegum's fall off last year, so if you want a more in-depth version of that you can watch that after this one anyway rice gum initially blew up off his these kids must be stopped series a series where he makes fun of cringeworthy kids on the musically app right, man. i don't know if you guys heard it this fucker just said i'll be drunk texting you i did some research it's full of 13. the public absolutely loved these videos and he quickly skyrocketed to 100,000 subscribers and only four months later he reached the 1 million subscriber mark he continued roasting other influencers and the main thing people looked forward to in his videos were the diss tracks your fans are little kids under the age of 12. tell me why your ears make you look like an elf you think i'm trying to roast you but i'm just trying to help psych i'm just here to give you this l right
Now, these diss tracks weren't good, but they were extremely entertaining at the time. As time went on, he only grew and was becoming a mainstream YouTuber. It was great seeing this 19 year old achieve his dreams. But on January 14th, 2017, he uploaded a video which many fans to this day claim was the beginning of his demise. Finally moving out of my mom's house is a video where Ricegum kind of just tells the audience he's moving. He did move, but three months later, he moved again into the Los Angeles Clout House, an influencer house founded by FaZe Banks, which included Alyssa Violet, Summer Rae, Wolfie Raps, FaZe K, and some other forgettable people. And I don't mean that in a mean way, like some people in there were genuinely forgettable. Now, this is where Ricegum's downfall truly began. Not statistically, though. I mean, he peaked in popularity at this house. Bigger videos, better production, more money, more fame, but that all came with a big ego. You see, if there's anything I've learned from doing research of YouTubers rise and fall or just celebrities rise and falls, it's to never get a big ego. That will just make sure your career dies. But I'm going off track now. Then one day, iDubbbz uploaded a content cop on Ricegum, a video where Ian completely rips Ricegum apart for being an arrogant, money-fueled YouTuber. He is extremely insecure and he makes it very obvious when he uploads videos like this where he details how much money he earns in a month on YouTube. There's like this video that has been going crazy viral and basically in the video he shows how much money YouTube has paid him. Everyone just giving him so much props, like everyone loves him. This dude is getting so much street credit, I'm like, I want some street cred too. Last month I made a roughly $60,000. Uh, I mean, it's okay. It is actually my lowest paid month. Once again, I only got 20 million views. I'm not sure what odds he's trying to improve. The odds that uh, a female will finally see him as a suitable sex candidate because he has money, or the odds that his child fan base will revere him more as a god. After this, Brian's videos began receiving a ton of dislikes. Now this, to other people, is Ricegum's downfall. I'll explain later why it wasn't. After this, his content began getting more uh lewd but hey they got views right then he got into this mystery box scamming situation where he didn't even apologize he just pointed fingers and was like hey they did it too there's this youtuber named reaction time he actually has more subscribers than me i don't know how because he's not cooler than me but anyways he made the same type of video the same type of video like three months ago no one said anything it wasn't a problem back then look 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 all these guys right here right they're in david dobrik's crew whatever they're influential got kid fans same thing open up boxes this was three weeks ago way before i was doing it why did no one bring it up three weeks ago or even talk about these guys. It seems like after this, he just started uploading extremely inconsistently. Fast forward to 2021, and he became a full-time Twitch streamer. The last the general public heard from him was when he was beefing with KSI, and then with Aiden Ross, which, by the way, I don't know if that was real or not, considering they lived in the same fucking house, but quite frankly, I don't care enough to look more into that. Ricegum's main channel hasn't seen an upload since 2020, and same with his Family Gum channel. He doesn't really tweet or post on Instagram. The times when he's most seen is on his girlfriend's TikTok, but personally, I truly believe that January 14th, 2017 was the beginning of Ricegum's downfall. Again, not numbers wise, but mentality wise. Moving to LA doesn't mean you're going to turn into this clout chasing demon, but if you let the lifestyle consume you, it will turn you to someone no one wants to support. I really would be interested in seeing Brian return to YouTube with a more humble and charismatic attitude. And I'll give him credit, he made his bag and left. He even started the entire diss track trend on YouTube, but his image will always be remembered as the arrogant hype beast who let fame get to his head. Call Me Carson Carson King, aka Call Me Carson, is a YouTuber who peaked at 2.9 million subscribers, and ever since the incident, his subscriber count has been trickling down. He began his YouTube journey by uploading Minecraft videos to his first two channels, which were called GamerCraft157 and Icebox Carson, before eventually moving to the Call Me Carson channel. His channel started taking off in 2017, with videos focusing on Discord trolling, reviewing internet media, and playing video games with his friends. The momentum continued, and the official name of his friend group became Lunch Club. It consisted of Call Me Carson, It's Joe, Joko, Jay Schlatt, Slimesicle, Ted Nevison, Hugbox, Travis, Connor Eats Pants, and C Scoop. I hope I pronounced all of those right. I am so used to calling Ted Nevison Ted Nevision, but I get corrected a lot. It seemed like nothing could go wrong for this friend group, and especially the leader, Call Me Carson. But on January 4th, 2021, a video was uploaded to Drama Alert of all places with the title Call Me Carson's Serious Allegations Lunch Club Interview. In this video, Lunch Club members Hugbox and Travis explained that Carson has been having inappropriate conversations with underage fans. This included the exchangement of lewd images as well. 
This information was told to them by Carson himself. That same day, a Twitter user whose information I'll be blurring out said this on Twitter. I can personally come out and say that I've been groomed by Carson. I have talked to many people and never came out about this since now. At the time, I was still 17 and in high school. Here's a few things he said to me. All right, guys, I hate reading word for word, especially when they're a little bit uh, inappropriate. Let's let's get into this. I'm scared and I want to talk to you for the wrong reasons. Elaborate. What if I only want to talk to you for the sexual part of it? I don't want that. But like, I'm worried about it. What if subconsciously I'm only talking to you because it turns me on or something? Is that really what you want? What other options are there? Also, what would you want to happen? I don't know. All I know is every time I jack off now, I have a really hard time not thinking of you. I guess my brain got stimulated and now it wants more, you know? Sorry, I was in school, but yeah, I get that. Uh, what if we read on Snap and next time you're horny, we can have some fun again? I just don't want that to be the only thing we do, you know? Yeah, but fuck, you're hard to resist. So are you. I feel like this is all my fault. Damn, if anything, it's my fault because I can't control myself. Fucking hell. I want to, but it's a bad idea. I'm not gonna lie. I'm scared of getting your hopes up or something. I'm willing to try, but it's such a bad idea. But so is sexting you. Fuck. Carson later revealed in his Discord that the texts were real. Long story short, when I was 19, I sexted a couple of viewers that were 17. Extremely regrettable and incredibly embarrassing. Felt guilty since. Apologized to them both and resolved it privately last year. Then Keem got a hold of it like two days ago. At the time, the girl was 17 and Carson was 19 years old. Though a two-year age gap isn't anything to glance about. I guess people did because one, this is a famous YouTuber and it's easy to like nitpick anything a famous person does. Two, even though the age of consent in the majority of the United States is 16, talking to people that are under 18 on the internet is like a well-known no-no thing to do, especially if you're famous. And three, people argued that there was a power dynamic, which honestly is something I do agree with. I mean, think about it. If you're a big YouTuber, your fans already see you as a god. So asking them for pictures might just make them feel like they're forced to because they don't want to let down their favorite YouTuber, right? Anyway, Carson lost followers, friends, and basically everything. He stopped uploading, stopped streaming, and would rarely tweet. And whenever he did tweet, he would like quickly delete it. It was like this for seven months until a video titled Moving Forward was uploaded by him. This specifically was August 25th, 2021. In this video, he doesn't discuss the situation at all. He says he doesn't want to make more drama and instead promotes the fact that he's going to be donating 100% of his earnings to charity. Hey guys, it's been a while. This isn't going to be your average YouTuber apology video, and I'm not going to make it long and drawn out. I've learned a lot this past year. I'm not seeking forgiveness, nor am I looking to make excuses. I'm sure some of you are expecting some long drawn out video explaining my truth of the situation, uh, but I have no intentions of doing that. I'd much rather just tell you what I can do in the future. For the next year, I plan to donate 100% of my profits to charity. And since that day, he's uploaded seven more videos onto his channel, and his views clearly don't match to those before the situation. So yeah, Carson is back, but with not nearly the same amount of love he once used to have. In fact, he gets hate under every single tweet he makes. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely trolls that just don't like him, but uh, I think this is a perfect time to move on. Alright guys, I want to give a quick update to the whole Call Me Carson situation. As you guys know, there's been a bunch of Twitch drama recently, and Hugbox actually wanted to add on to that. I won't say it like that, but I'll just say he did add on to the drama, though I didn't see anyone talk about this. Um, just happened to stumble across it while doing my research. So here's Hugbox's Twitter, and Hugbox actually made a twit longer. Uh, with the title game over this guy I got almost 5,000 likes like I would say it got it got some attraction I have no idea how I did not hear about this at all, but the twit longer is a, it's a lengthy read It's a very lengthy read, but uh, I'll just give you guys uh, the important sentences I'm gonna try to explain the relevant events of the last couple years in the most concise way possible This was always written off as drama when I try to talk about it But I only spoke of it because it really bothered me and I cared It's not easy to be threatened with legal action when you're just trying to tell people what's going down That's why my tweets were always so cryptic I'm not a clout chaser. I haven't even made money over the last several years. Only alienated my audience since I started talking about this stuff. And at this point, want absolutely nothing to do with the internet. We'll start with the Carson thing. I found out about what he did in March 2020, and for a moment considered tweeting it right then and there. Unfortunately, I did not have any concrete details initially. In fact, the few details I had were lies. The group had a meeting later that day which our manager, Ryan, told us that he had dealt with this several times before and we can make this go away. And some members of the group insisted that we needed to stick by Carson. At this point, I was checked out completely, but naively was shocked that so many people seemed to value their careers over doing the right thing. Over the next several months, I started asking around as to what others had been told. And 
and found out that every single person was told an entirely different story as to how many girls he was contacting and what their ages were. This pushed me to do something, and I had actually gotten the entire group to agree to recording a video of each of us simply saying what we were told and uploading it directly to the Lunch Club channel. No baseless accusations, no clout chasing, just the truth. At the last moment, many pulled out of the video because in Schlatt's words, he had too much to lose. Deja vu. It was never supposed to go through Keemstar. I'm gonna skip this paragraph again, you guys can just go to Hugbox's Twitter to read the whole thing because it is a lot. Carson had a whole discord of content creators that aided him in strategizing damage control in the lead up to the drama alert because naturally Ryan had gone behind my back, warned him, and tried to prep him. I know this because not all of them suck and they told me what was up. Then the creators in that discord fled like rats from a sinking ship when it was clear the situation was not salvageable. I called Carson several times in the days leading up to the drama alert because I did not want the venue to discredit the story and I wanted him to take responsibility for his actions like a fucking adult. To this day he hasn't even admitted to what he did and everyone still thinks it was a two year age gap. That is not true. So if we go to the responses on the tweet, we get stuff like this. I like how instead of telling us why it was worse than a two year age gap, he simply didn't. Him. Elaborate on that. No. It's a very strange twit longer because, I mean, he's being cryptid like he said, but he says something about legal action, so... I don't know. I don't know that. I'm just, I'm just the messenger. I want to make that clear. I'm just the messenger and I just felt like I should update you guys since something else came through to the story. It's very odd that Hugbox says that there wasn't a two year age gap. It was that that was not it. But yet this girl says that she's 17. But I also remembered apparently there were multiple girls. I don't know. It's very weird. What I'm telling you guys is not factual. Again, just the messenger. But yeah, uh, I guess now we're actually going to talk about another YouTuber, you know, because we're continuing the video. Shout out to Finance of Freddy's t-shirt. But yeah, let's head on to the next person on the list. Phase K and Phase Jarvis. Phase Clan was created in 2010 and began as a Call of Duty sniping team. Members would achieve impressive clips only using sniper rifles and later create montages which would be uploaded onto YouTube. When Phase Clan started out, they were all just kids in high school enjoying the most played game at the time. By 2012, the YouTube channel had hit a million subscribers and it was the thing to know about Phase Clan if you played Call of Duty. Everyone and their mom wanted to join Phase Clan at one point. I, I wanted to join Phase. 2014 to 2016 is when I would say Phase truly peaked. This was when the main members of FaZe all moved into a house in New York and called that the FaZe House. Many fans still say this was the best era to be a fan of FaZe. And FaZe hasn't stopped growing at all. They even have esports teams in every major video game. They also recruit athletes, and not to mention that their main focus is still Call of Duty, with members such as Swag who grind competitive Call of Duty. Also, I can't talk about FaZe without mentioning the best member, FaZe Jev. Yo Jev, if you're watching this, I just want to let you know you're a huge inspiration to me, and thank you so much for always being you. Anyway, let's first talk about FaZe K, who joined FaZe in 2013. This was thanks to his sniping skills. He would upload gaming content and occasionally have his younger brother Jarvis join in on videos. What's going on guys, this is FaZe K and I'm doing a Q&A today. I asked some of you guys on Twitter to ask questions to ask my brother who is here next to me. Though K never got nearly as many views as his American peers, I'll give him credit for going outside the box and attempting to capture the more IRL side of gamers. And when he would get views, it was for very out of place content like uh, water bottle flip videos. You'd never expect that to be uploaded by a FaZe member. I mean, they brought in views, so he was doing something right. Around this time is when his younger brother Jarvis began uploading content of his own, but things would change in 2018 around Fortnite's peak. K would begin to make videos revolving around his little brother and Fortnite. The views were immense and at this point K was living in a new LA phase house. Or the clout house. Either way, it was a fucking influencer house. Eventually, thanks to his skills and very, very saturated thumbnails, Jarvis joined the one and only FaZe Clan in 2019. The momentum only continued. And then Jarvis got banned from playing Fortnite due to using hacks in the game, aimbot to be specific. He wasn't playing competitively, he just downloaded some mods and uh, wanted to make a cool video out of it. I'm truly like so sorry. Epic, I know I have to take accountability for my actions and you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to accept any punishment or like comes my way, whatever happens. Epic Games decided to make an example out of him and banned him from playing the game. No, this doesn't mean that when he goes to his friend's house and picks up the controller, the FBI just breaks down the fucking door and arrests him. It just meant that if he made any new accounts publicly, they would all just automatically get banned. This also meant Jarvis had to switch content. He basically became a copy and paste of FaZe Rug doing challenges and TikTok life hacks. By the way, these thumbnails are still, uh... They're very bright. In 2020, he quote unquote fooled the internet that he was playing Fortnite again. He went live and had someone else play for him. Then his username got leaked and Epic Games banned him on the spot. But when did FaZe K and FaZe Jarvis's careers go to shit? Kids. 
the Save the Kids crypto scam. Remember when every YouTuber was hopping onto the crypto coin NFT train? Well, this was one of them. This was a coin that claimed it would be used for charity and use the likes of K, Jarvis, Tico, Ricegum, and Nikon in order to get more clout. This was an entire mess, and I'm gonna dumb it down for you guys, but if you guys want full explanation, make sure to go watch CopyZilla's video. It's an amazing detailed video. But yeah, to dumb it down, fans would buy this coin thinking that the value was only gonna go up. You know, they probably thought it was gonna be the next Bitcoin, but instead, the owners of the coin just left with all the money. I believe this is called a pump and dump scam. All the people in that video were a part of it except Tico. Tico was genuinely innocent, which is why he's back in phase now. But everyone else in that video, yeah, they got a lot of money from the fans that were trying to support this charity. Due to this, K was kicked from phase and Jarvis, Nikon, and Tico were suspended until further notice. And Ricegum, well, he's Ricegum. He wasn't a part of like any team or anything. He's just himself so this is where k's career started going downhill i mean why wouldn't it who wants to support a scammer then k came out saying that the mastermind behind all of this was sam pepper yeah the dude with black ops 3 dark matter for hair this response wasn't really taken that well and his views dipped right after this while editing this i thought i got the wrong channel i thought i put jarvis's channel instead of k's but notice how much k uses his brother in his thumbnails like do you not think you have a photogenic face i literally thought this was jarvis's channel i was like okay i gotta re-screenshot it no this is Kay's channel. I did not make a mistake. Again, please stop the oversaturated thumbnails. Jarvis had a boxing match, which he won, and he was back in phase. Then this video was uploaded. Why I left FaZe Clan, where he explains that he left FaZe Clan because his big brother was kicked. Weird for me because I don't want to be a part of FaZe if like you're not in FaZe as well. Yeah. Because obviously me and you, we um you we started work. YouTube since the very beginning trust <laughs> all of this happened because of you and you pushing me to like make videos start vlogging you know start streaming it really all happened because you pushed me to do it oh so sweet except not really because this is when Jarvis would begin uploading less frequently and get less views and no youtube shorts don't count because those views are from randoms not your fans i forgot to mention that they have another channel called Jarvis and K where they do upload more frequently but the views aren't there either and for some reason while watching their videos i feel like they're always finding a way to diss phase seven months ago i left phase clan and and after watching these TikToks, I think I made the right decision. It's like, I, I get the vibe of like biting the hand that fed you. I mean, even the fans dislike the videos and it's very, it's very weird. I don't know. It seems like they have a big ego after leaving FaZe. I truly believe Drivers could have saved his career by just staying in FaZe. It doesn't matter if you were banned from Fortnite. There's new Call of Duties every year to make content on. I get that family comes first and that's super respectable that he did that. But rejoining FaZe doesn't mean, fuck you, bro to your brother. It just means you're looking out for yourself. It's quite literally your livelihood. Nowadays, they both upload shorts and Mr. Beast inspired videos, but it doesn't seem their audience is there anymore. Jarvis had a video get over a million views recently, but it's because face members are in it. Pretty, pretty ironic. I mean, you could have stayed. You could have fucking stayed in the group. But yeah, let's head on to the next one. Kiwis. Kiwis first started gaining popularity in 2014-2015 when he was part of the Call of Duty team Red Reserve. This team was seen as a stepping stone to FaZe Clan. During this time, the Red House became a thing and this included Formula, Random, Nyx, Kiwis, and Game Gandhi. Since we're talking about Red, I gotta mention Red's best member, Game Gandhi. He was always the best person out of their crew and had the best content and it just sucks that he got grouped with these this team. Anyway, this house had a life of its own. Like, the chemistry was there and the Gandhi vlogs were sweet and to the point. They weren't seen as rip-off phase anymore, they were just becoming red. Until one day in 2016, Keemstar uploaded a video where Kiwis attempts to justify why he sent a 12-year-old girl images while he was 17. And that had started a year and a half before the interview, so now the girl was 14 and he was 19. Either way, it's fucking disgusting. And then he proceeds to shoot himself in the foot. Because... Okay, so it, you it's sent... Just, it was just sent, weird. You sent pictures when... You were 17 and she was 12. Now, I believe she said that she you said she was 14. I believe and the kick logs will the kick logs will prove it. Like if you guys get it, like okay, it's there, but she like... said she was 14 or whatever. But I but but she was, was a month ago. Yeah, and a month ago on Snapchat, yes. Okay, so a month ago you sent her a picture. Yes, but the problem with that is you're 19 and she's 14 at the time. But the th the thing like. I was in a really like depressed state like I she was talking to me like she kept on saying how she she like she was saying how she was so attached to me and I, I was saying and she said how she wanted to meet up and I said that's really weird I don't want to meet up like that's something you can't bank on like that's just really weird I, I don't want to do that 
and she's 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 claimed that she wants to meet up with other people. There's there's another person in red that she talks to that she wanted to meet up with um, specifically, and we can talk more about that in private. But oddly enough, this wasn't the end of his career. He continued uploading and even uploaded a response video where he flat out victim blames the girl. I shouldn't have trusted this girl. I shouldn't have. I I don't know why I did what I did. She she convinced me that I could trust her and. It, it was a mistake and that's something I will never make ever again. This girl lied about her age and convinced me to send her pictures of myself. Like she sent pictures to me too, but his audience seemed to have liked it and supported it. By this time, everyone knew about the situation and due to living in the red house, the address was public. I don't know if they publicized it themselves. I'm sure they wouldn't dox themselves so fans could come over and say hi, but their address was known. Anyway, Kiwis got confronted at his own house by a random person, but it was done horribly. The person called them a like, the dude filming could have at least had some factual stuff instead of just saying that he's a <laughs> Red formula. Yeah, the leader up, of guys? the Red Reserve. What's up, man? How's it going? How What's good, doing? man? How you doing, man? What's good? Uh, you a fan? Yeah, I'm a fan of the Red Reserve. <laughs> is Kiwis around? Yeah, he is. Uh, uh, you wanna... think I could talk to him? Yeah, sure. Uh, you wanna, you wanna come on in for a bit? Yeah, sure. Red what? Kiwis, oh, hey, DJ Tittynax, yeah, Real what's up? Life, the man with the big shorts. <laughs> yeah, what's up, dude? Um, I wanted to ask you a question. Okay. Why did you rip that girl? Oh, uh, you think you're funny? <laughs> yes. Right. That is not funny at all, dude. All right, you gotta leave me. <laughs> you wanna leave, bud? Um, that, you gotta get out of the house. What, what, why did you do you it? You gotta get out of the house. Why did I? Do you even know what, the story? What? Come on, yeah, get, yeah, get, yeah, I know the whole story. Get, get out of the fucking house. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? You sent your dick. Online yeah, to a girl don't that, touch was four, don't touch that was just 14 years old. That You're was 14 years old. Do you realize that? Do you, do you not understand Here, that she out. completely lied about her age? Get out of the house. It's proven. Get out of the fucking house. That's why I'm here. The reason why Kiwi's story is so odd is because he never stopped uploading. He even peaked in 2018, two years after that situation. This was, of course, with the help of overly saturated Fortnite thumbnails. Yay. Fast forward to 2021 and skipping over his new team, which failed. Drummuller uploaded a documentary about him and he got dislikes for a little bit, but kept uploading. His views nowadays are nowhere near his peak and it's just sad, really. Seeing when YouTubers ruin their careers, but don't have anywhere else to go because they make their money on the internet. I mean, they could go work at their local food for less, but I think at that point, of being a YouTuber, your ego's really high, so you just don't want to do that. And there's a chance you could get recognized, which is always gonna be awkward. We're literally watching these people die inside, but yeah. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching the video. I just wanna say I don't condone the harassment of any of these people. I don't want my subscribers to be those subscribers that go to these pages and leave hate comments. Don't do that. Let's just, just watch from the sidelines, chill out. But looking at all these names, I would the only person I would say really didn't do anything wrong, just made like a, I guess a bad decision was Jarvis. I don't think he did anything to get canceled for. He just got banned on Fortnite and uh, he chose his brother over FaZe Clan, which I think was the wrong decision. Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear. Leave a like, make sure to subscribe to the channel and make sure to go to EarlDoesn'tExist.com to get yourself some new Earl clothing and use code back to school for, I don't even know how much percent off, it's on the screen. Yeah, music video coming out soon. The name of that song is Overdose and that'll be part of my nine to 10 track EP. There will be a whole movie on this channel. So I can't wait for you guys to see that. I'm so excited. Sorry for missing an upload. I was recording the music video for that. So follow me on TikTok, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. All the ads were right there, specifically TikTok. Like I hate when I pop up on people's for you page and they're like, oh my God, you have a, yes, I have, a, I have all social medias, bro. What do you thought? I'm a YouTuber. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I'm gonna go have sex with your mom and I'll see you guys next time I upload.